You're listening to 91.7 FM, WSUW, in Whitewater, Wisconsin. You're listening to WSUW, 91.7 FM, The Edge in Whitewater, Wisconsin, and this is Rashkin Report. I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin, and I'm excited to welcome to the program David Satter. Uh, David has written about Russia for almost four decades. He's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and a fellow of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Um, and uh, I'm excited to welcome uh, David to the program to, first of all, talk about his latest book, uh, The Less You Know, The Better You Sleep, and uh, as well as uh, his general ideas on what is going on in Russia. I think that is the topic that is... Uh, all of a sudden on front pages of every newspaper, um, much to the surprise of people who study Russia. David, welcome to the program. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad to be with you. If you would uh, tell, please, uh, in a few words, why do you feel that your books are particularly important to read for Americans? Because I think in America we have this feeling like things that happen outside are really not as important or relevant to us. Um, now we are paying a little more attention to Russia because it seems to have maybe meddled in our elections. But even even then, why should we care about what buildings get blown up in Moscow, what theater rescue goes wrong, what how good or bad a uh, person is Yeltsin or Putin? Well, for one thing, the events in Russia can affect us here. I mean, we've had an example of that with the recent elections, that uh, problems that exist in one part of the world don't stay confined to that part of the world necessarily. Uh, we, we, we have examples with uh, the recent terrorist acts as well. Uh, that uh, of just how dangerous it can be when situations outside the country are allowed to develop and uh, are not corrected because obviously the world is very interconnected now but uh, but beyond self-interest there's another reason why we ought to be concerned about Russia uh, and that is that uh, Russians are actually not that different from Americans. They uh, succumb to the temptation of uh, utopianism, of uh, collectivism, uh, uh, of the dream of building a new world. But that dream exists everywhere. And the consequences that it had uh, in Russia are a warning in a, in a way uh, to the whole world about what can happen to a society when it loses its moral moral bearings and attempts suddenly to create heaven on earth now we could say that of course soviet union no longer exists communism no longer exists but what we have in russia is the aftermath we have the mentality we have the habits we have the uh the the psychology and that uh, uh stands as a warning really uh to people all over the world about the importance of uh, operating on the basis of common sense, of not forsaking kind of core moral principles. So do you feel that Russia is in a way a cautionary tale to us? Russia is a cautionary tale for the whole world, and it has been for a long time, in fact. Uh, this, uh, this quality of Russia was first noted in the 19th century by Pyotr Chudayev, Uh, Russian writer and philosopher who wrote wrote uh, a series of philosophical letters in which he said that uh, Russia exists to teach the world some great lesson. As a result of those letters, he was put in a mental hospital. He was the first Russian victim of psychiatric repression, although unfortunately not the last. I put out the the word that I will be speaking with you, and I had a few uh, questions that were submitted, so I wanted to ask you some of those. Uh, sure. A per, uh, person says, I expect you, you'll be asking uh, Mr. Satter about the Putin-Trump bromance. Is Trump being played, or is he playing Putin? Well, I don't think that Trump uh, is sophisticated enough in matters of international affairs or of... Uh, Russia policy to play Putin. I think that uh, for the moment, uh, uh, he's allowing his superficiality to dictate his reactions. 
So uh, it is Putin who has a more realistic view of the United States and of U.S.-Russian relations, who's most likely doing the playing. But it's important to bear in mind that it's, we're still at a very early stage. Uh, Trump has not had the experience of dealing with Putin over serious issues. And once he has that experience, some of the romance may wear off. Do you feel that the, uh, this friendly relationship between Trump and Putin is purely based on policy ideas and approaches, or are there different, um, more nefarious reasons? I mean, obviously, you know, I don't, I, I doubt that anybody has any specific information that they, you know, even our security agencies, but, uh, your thoughts on this based on your experience and understanding of Russia and how it operates? Well, do you mean do do I think that the the the, the Russians have some information that they is, can is, use? It, is this uh, exactly do I yeah tell, uh, uh, Trump there are rumors about that in Washington based on nothing in particular except for the fact that that uh, Trump was a was a visitor to Moscow he was the you know he he organized a beauty pageant there. Uh, it would be natural for for the Russian intelligence services to keep an eye on him. And uh, uh, it's possible that they may have tried in some way to compromise him. But the, but the re- reality is that he's not that easy a person to compromise. Pretty much anything, a lot of what they could come up with uh, are things that, that are well known about him. Uh, so I doubt that that's really the motivator. Uh, uh, and of course, all of these rumors are unsubstantiated. I think that he imagines that Russia uh, can act decisively against Islamic terrorism. He's unfamiliar with the true record of Russia, which often involves facilitating Islamic terrorism and using it for the for the regime's own purposes. It's going to be. A, the task of the American intelligence community to enlighten him uh, to a certain extent. One of the things that, that he'll need to be enlightened about uh, uh, is, is the 1999 Russian apartment bombings. Well, and and that's just the idea that uh, Putin has no problems of committing crimes against his own people in order to accomplish his his goals. So all means justify the ends. That's so. That's the conclusion that uh, David. You know, I, I'm, that, I he, wanna... that he ought to draw, and and that I think he will draw if he if he looks at the evidence. I'm just a little bit confused myself because when I hear Trump uh, uh, sharing talking points that clearly seem to have come from Russia today. Um, that I, I wonder where he gets his information and why those are his talking points. Is that just influence of uh, General Flynn? There are people in Washington who are uh, uh, disinformators, uh, if that's the proper word, or people who are uh, uh, good sources of, 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 of false and misleading information, including Americans, uh, who have been manipulated and, and uh, worked over by uh, by the Russians. Uh, we have a tradition of that in this country, of people who explain Russia to the American public, and they do so uh, oftentimes from academic posts or posts in think tanks, and uh, they have a certain amount of credibility, which the Russians do everything possible to reinforce. They try to give the impression that these people are uh, re- realists, that they have uh, good sources in the Russian government who provide them with you know, hard, you know, hard information that others cannot get. And uh, uh, a politician who's inexperienced, who's vain, who's superficial, uh, and who relies on such people can easily be induced to repeat the things that are being said by Russia today. I think that's what's happening. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to go on forever. In, as I was preparing for our conversation, uh, in one of the interviews of yours that I've seen, you mentioned that uh, the Russian security services at some point got 75 hours of uh, Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky, phone sex, uh, you know, data. 
and and you mentioned that that may have even been possibly used to extricate some uh, concessions out of Clinton administration. You you really mentioned very briefly, and I was really curious about that. Uh, is there more to that story? Well, this is what I was told by the f- a former head of the American National Intelligence Council that there were. That I believe there that the the star. Uh, Ken Starr report de- documents that there were something like 75 hours of phone sex and um, that uh, as for uh, indications that the Russians and other intelligence services got their hands on those recordings, um, I don't have firsthand information about that. I was told that by a very reliable source. Uh, who was in the uh, intelligence, highly placed in the intelligence community at that time. Uh, And so, uh, but it's plausible, certainly. And uh, that's, uh, and in, in the discussion of Hillary's emails and in the discussion of the Russian hacking, uh, that's a report that, uh, needed to be checked out. It wasn't, because just as an indication of the possible consequences of not being careful when you're in a high position. The, the, the information, as it was told to me, and I pass this on just as, uh, for the moment, unconfirmed uh, information, uh, was that these record that... Uh, uh, the Russian intelligence service did obtain these recordings and that they were used to pressure uh, uh, the Clinton administration and Bill Clinton in, John, in, in particular into approving a $4 billion IMF emergency grant uh, for Russia in 1998. And that grant, dis- that money disappeared uh, because it was given on the verge of the financial collapse. So they were handed out. So in, in, it's possible that IMF handed over to uh, Russian, you know, the security services essentially, and whoever are the people that directly stand behind them, um, potentially up to four billion dollars. Possibly, possibly. Uh, what I would say about this is that this is a a report from a good source that nonetheless requires uh, further confirmation. Do you think that numbers have gone up in a sense that if Trump is being pressured, the numbers would be higher? I, I don't know. I'm <laughs> now, we don't have anything specific to, to that he's being pressured uh, for the moment. How do uh, you feel about the reliability of uh, security agencies in this country to tell us accurate information about the threat that Russia may or may not present? Well, I think that, that they're they're pretty good in a lot of ways. But uh, they, uh, for example, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the CIA for information about the 1999 apartment bombings. Mm-hmm. They're refusing to say, not only are they refusing to say what their conclusions were at that time, 17 years ago, about the bombings, but they refuse even to indicate whether they have any documents. So... Uh, we do know that despite the fact that uh, the explanation for the bomb that was discovered in the basement uh, of a building in Riazan, uh, the explanation that, that this was part of a training exercise, despite the fact that this was completely implausible, our government never questioned that official explanation at least not publicly. And uh, that, uh, that plus the fact that the security agencies now, I mean the CIA, uh, is unwilling to, to reveal what they, what they knew at the time, suggests that there's a problem there. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. There's something you know, the, that there was some reason why that, inf- why that, ridiculous Russian explanation was not challenged, why the U.S. did not pose further questions. Because this is a very important moment. It allowed Russia to bury the, the, all the suspicions about the apartment bombings. 
because no one was questioning it. Isn't it just about politics that at the time it was not to perception, you know, United States interests to uh, dig further into whether Russian government is organizing terrorist acts against its own citizens. Um, but now, now everything gets brought up the same way that with Litvinenko, when he was poisoned in uh, London, it took 10 years for that process to go all you know the entire distance to trial and, uh, and decision uh, because it seemed like political winds were blowing in that direction it's possible uh, for one thing it, the uh, apartment bombings uh, had to if they were carried out by the government they were carried out by the Yeltsin on Yeltsin entourage Sure, and our policy because Putin wasn't in power at the time. Putin but wasn't was wasn't Putin in charge of FSB at the time? He was in charge of the uh, FSB, and then he became prime minister. But the plot. So wouldn't it be his people you know, executing it? Oh, it could well have been his people executing it for sure. But but the decision to do it would not have been made by Putin. Sure. Uh, and uh, this is an important fact because our policy was that Yeltsin is the symbol of democracy. And so if the symbol of democracy has approved or organized or condoned a terrorist act against his own people, uh, it doesn't make our policy look very perceptive, does it? And uh, I think that there may have been career considerations involved on the part of uh, a lot of people when it came to deciding whether or not to raise this issue. You're listening to WSUW 91.7 FM, The Edge in Whitewater, Wisconsin. This is Rashkin Report, and I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. I'm speaking today with uh, David Satter, a journalist and author of many books, including most recently, The Less You Know, The Better You Sleep, Russia's Road to Terror and Dictatorship under Yeltsin and Putin. Um, David, another question that I received online says, I wonder if Putin um, feels that or if Putin feels the successes of hacking during the USA elections will embolden future hacks of democratic states during elections. Well, I think that we're in an age now. I think this is an important precedent. Uh, uh, first of all, Russian cyber attacks are not new. Uh, the, there was a massive Russian cyber attack on Estonia, a NATO ally, in 2007. That's almost 10 years ago. Uh, the, it, the, the attempt to hack into the Democratic Party uh, computers and, uh, and in, uh, indeed the, pro the private server of the Secretary of State, that should have all been expected. Uh, and I don't think that the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia are going to make the slightest bit of difference in the future because the technology will develop, the, ha the skills will develop, and the stakes will remain extremely high. And uh, so I think that, that hacking is going to be just part of life. Uh, and anyone who has confidential, sensitive information needs to keep it in mind that, that they cannot count on keeping that information private If, uh, unless they're in super secure systems, which the Democrats uh, apparently were not. Uh, and uh, it's best, first of all, to keep sensitive communications off the Internet and out, uh, and out of computers. Uh, and second of all, it's best uh, not to do things that you wouldn't want the world to know about. Is there anything do you feel that Vladimir Putin would not do? To hold on to power? Well, it's, it seems like it's about, all about holding on to power and saving his life, perhaps. But is it, will well, he think, start yeah, a nuclear war? You know, for, I think in the, in the service of wealth and power, he'd probably be ready to do anything. I mean, he was, he was part of a uh, – I mean, all evidence suggests, and the evidence is extremely strong. It's not a conspiracy, conspiracy theory. This is a matter of – of overwhelming and incontrovertible evidence that uh, Putin was part of a plot uh, to blow up uh, uh, civilian apartment buildings in order to come to power. And someone who was willing to participate in such a crime would be willing to do, I think, pretty much anything. 
So his track record does show that, well, but to be fair, I think in the United States, we tend to be more concerned about either hacking. Is there any kind of hacking he wouldn't do? At this point, we see that he'll do anything. And the other part is nuclear war. Do you think that that Putin could start a nuclear war with the United States? Well, uh, I don't think that you, when you when the subject is new, I think he can threaten a nuclear war. The the and there's a big difference between threatening one and care and launching one, because uh, in the case of blowing up innocent civilians in their homes in the middle of the night, he doesn't risk anything right. except risks getting caught. Starting a nuclear war with the United States could have consequences for him. And uh, I think that although in, in morally probably uh, uh, doesn't have particular barriers to anything, uh, he, he's, he, he is certainly a person who has a very highly developed sense of self-preservation. I mean, that's obvious simply with the way he surrounds himself with his cronies, the way, the, the way in which he accumulates wealth. Uh, the the way in which he holds on to power, this and and the behavior also of his cronies and the way they they they, they hoard money the, and and I mean w- recently, Igor Sechin, one of his uh, 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 Putin's closest associates, bought himself a new wife. I mean he doesn't want to see her, uh, him a situation in which he and her are both blown to bits in a nuclear holocaust. I mean, that's not the idea. These people are not fanatics. They're 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 massively corrupt, uh, but they have no interest in committing collective suicide. So, uh, so Mr. Putin is more likely to blow up, resign, or some other city in Russia than he is to launch a nuclear attack against the United States. Well, he's not likely to do anything that could rebound against himself. Uh, uh, a nuclear attack against the United States. Uh, would mean the annihilation of of of, of, of those who, who launched it, including him, and he doesn't want that. On the other hand, uh, he's perfectly uh, inclined toward risky behavior that could lead to a situation in which such an uh, 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 a Holocaust is 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 triggered accidentally, because he's uh, or or through miscalculations. He, he's been engaged in, in rather risky behavior. Like if Putin reads Trump's Twitter? No, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's the behavior. I mean, the, the uh, uh, Russian aircraft have been buzzing American ships in the Baltic Sea and, and carrying out extremely risky maneuvers. I mean, even the mere fact of threatening nuclear war is risky because it raises tensions. But it seems like with Russia, it's particularly obvious how politicized anything can be when a russian ambassador to turkey was shot uh, on like on live tv basically um there was a there was a talk for a day or two that perhaps this will pull russia and turkey apart that was the purpose and and so on um but russia decided that for its purposes you know they were interested in being friendly with turkey at this time therefore killing of an ambassador meant nothing um, well, first of all, it's important to bear in mind that it was not the Turkish government necessarily that, that was responsible for the for the murder of the ambassador. It was a, a sympathizer with the uh, Syrian opposition. Apparently. Sure, but this was an event that could have been played either way. Yeah, indeed. But I don't think that there was a necessity to play it uh, in the way in which you suggest that uh, – that, uh, there, there was no no particular reason to blame Turkey, okay. especially since uh, that probably is not accurate anyway. Sure. So, so uh, they do publicize. They do. I'm sorry. Politicize many of these events when it is to their advantage, and uh, I think that they 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 would be happy to show that. Uh, uh, the murder of the Russian ambassador reveals the terrorist essence of the people they're attacking in Syria. I mean that, that because that 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 makes sense for them. That that that's consistent with their policy objectives. But I don't think that uh, that they have a particular reason or motivation right now to use the the murder of the ambassador to uh, uh, 
provoke a confrontation with Turkey across the board because right now they, 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 they aren't in that kind of situation with Turkey. Right. Um, and another, I don't know if it's a more serious or less serious question, but it says, ask him something useful like what should we start hoarding first? Water, toilet paper, gluten-free donuts? We're just newbies to the whole dictator running our country lifestyle, and we need some advice. I see he's talking about uh, Trump being yes. the new dictator. Yeah, right. what should we hoard? That that question, you know, you'd be amazed at how many people are are thinking in those terms, They're getting ready for mass resistance. And uh, I think it's the a reflection of the fact that we in America have had a kind of privileged existence. Uh, we don't really know what a dictator looks like. We don't know what it means to live without civil liberties. We don't understand that there are places where people can be. Uh, dragged off in the middle of the night for a rendezvous with the secret police. I mean, these things for us are, are very strange. So the slightest change in our political situation uh, inspires all kinds of wild comparisons. I don't think that there's any, any need to uh, hoard food, water, or anything else. I don't think that, that, that the accession of Trump is going to mean more than bad policy on a, on a a variety of issues, none of which are going to affect the the way of life of of, of Americans in, in a major way. And um, there, but I think that more da- the more dangerous than anything Trump can do is the level of hysteria that's being chinned up uh, over his election, because that that could lead to confrontation and division in society rather than the policy moves that Trump is likely or unlikely to make. We don't know right now what's going to happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, Americans lack historical perspective. They, um, they don't know what mass repression looks like the way Russians do. It reminds me of a, of a, of a person I knew whose father-in-law told him, who had fought in the Second World War and, and told him, you know, if people with guns aren't trying to kill you, you, you don't have a problem. And uh, <laughs> in a way, Americans need to keep in mind that uh, uh, with, the, with, uh, with the civil liberties in this country, with rule by law, uh, uh, we may be upset about the results of the election, or some people might be, but it's not the end of the world. Good to know. A couple of things I wanted to ask you before we wrap up. (coughs) First one, I think the concept that is coming up very frequently these days in Russia, and perhaps a concept that Americans should be more familiarized with, and that is a hybrid warfare. Um, What are your thoughts on this as far as the word hybrid? How it obviously, you know, starting a nuclear war would be a real war, and therefore that would kind of violate the rules of hybrid engagement as we understand them now. But what are your thoughts on on the hybrid war? What is is that about? Well, you know, this is a term that that begins to circulate, and people don't really think about what it means particularly. What we had in the case of Ukraine was not a hybrid, hybrid warfare. We had hidden warfare. We had a situation in which the aggressor tried to hide what it was doing, and uh, it was a real – the the term hybrid warfare bothers me a little because it was a real war. Okay. It was a war in which the intentions and uh, the behavior of the uh, aggressive side uh, were, were disguised. That's all. And uh, so we could say that this is – you know, covert war or uh, surreptitious war uh, or masqueraded war. I, I don't know, but a hybrid war, hybrid in what sense? Part war, part something else? Well, I guess the idea is, is that you have a country that doesn't declare war on another country, but yet it engages in, mm-hmm. in activities that clearly undermine that country's uh, stability. Awesome. All right, undeclared war. Undeclared war. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what about Mr. Snowden? He is kind of in a, you know, his position and he, the the way he's viewed, I think, is going through a little bit of transformation these days, um, in part because of the hacking scandal and the security issues and the fact that he resides in Moscow and seems to be in close touch with Russian security apparatus, I understand, from his attorney who is working with the security apparatus closely and so forth. What are your thoughts on, on Mr. Snowden? 
Well, uh, Miss, Mr. Snowden needs to be brought back to the United States uh, so that he can stand trial uh, for breaching American security and putting American citizens, uh, violating his oath, putting American citizens in danger. We need to find out more about his connections with Russian intelligence, uh, you know, who he was really working for. I mean, there's nothing to say. I mean, he is, he is a criminal and he needs to be treated as such. All right. In conclusion, kind of going back to your book, what is the main point that you want people to take away from reading The Less You Know, The Better You Sleep? I could say that uh, the main the main point is the title. <laughs> <laughs> But then better, why read it? Better to know more, better to know more and sleep less. Uh, but uh, I think the point is that uh, this is a regime... Uh, that uh, really operates without any moral limits, and you have to, you, and that has to be taken into account. Right. David Satter, thank you so much for being on Rashkin Report, and I hope we can continue this conversation in the future. Yeah, be glad to. You're listening to 91.7 FM, WSUW, in Whitewater, Wisconsin. listening to Rashkin Report.